Hallelujah. Good evening, church family. I want to welcome everyone here to service tonight. Welcome everyone by live stream. Let's go ahead and stand to our feet. We're going to spend some time in worship. We praise you and glorify you, Father. We thank you for the wonderful opportunity, the honor, the privilege that it is to be in your house. We've come ready. We've come expecting. We've come excited. We've come ready to receive all that you have for us tonight. And we thank you, Father, that your will be done in this service in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. His 
his name together.
thank you tonight that you deserve all the glory you deserve all the praise father we magnify you our king our lord our savior our god we worship you you are worthy of it all you're worthy of it all father everything that's good and everything that's right and everything that's wholesome and pure in our life is because of you and we honor you and bless you Let's just sing that one more time. You're worthy of it all. Let's just worship him just for a moment. Worship him from your heart. Worthy of it all. Come on. Yes, you are. You are worthy of it all. for all the places and all the times and all the places you brought us out of. So grateful, Lord, for what you're doing in our life. You deserve all the glory, changing our life, delivering our life, setting us free. Father, how could we thank you enough? How could we worship you enough for all that you've done for us and your goodness and your love and your compassion and your kindness towards us, your tender mercy. Oh, we're so grateful, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in our lives. And truly, Lord, you deserve all the glory. You are worthy of it all. And we're 
we're grateful tonight, Father. We're thankful, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us out. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us into. Thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing in our life. Thank you, Lord, that you never give up on us. Thank you, Lord, you've always been there for us. Thank you, Lord, that you are the strength, you are the hope, you are the joy, you are the peace. You are our everything. And we love you, Father, with all our heart. And we thank you, Lord, for this service tonight. You get all the glory. You get all the praise for all that's done in this place. And we give you all the praise and all the glory. And everybody said, amen. How many of y'all know he's worthy of it all? Praise God. I, I remember where my life was at. And I remember where it's at today. And what's in between there has been God. He brought me through and brought me into and brought me out of. And I'm just so grateful, so thankful. And he's worthy of it. He's worthy of it. He's been so good to me. Amen. And I'm grateful tonight. How many of y'all are grateful tonight? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, it's good to see everybody tonight. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, you can go ahead and be seated tonight. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. It's a sweet anointing in here tonight. Praise God. So grateful. So thankful. You know, some words you try to, you try to put English words with what you feel in your heart and or sense in your heart and they just don't add up. <laughs> you know. And uh, I'm just grateful tonight. Amen. Thankful for what, what God's doing in our lives. Amen. And uh, I'm grateful that Dr. Jacobs is with us and thankful for the service tonight and all that God's been ministering to us. And, and um, I just want you to know that God loves you so much. He really, really loves you. And he's really for you. And he's got such a wonderful plan for your life. That's for somebody tonight. You just know that God loves you. He loves you. He's always going to be there for you. He'll never give up on you. Amen. He'll stay closer to you. When everybody else is not around, he'll be there with you. He loves you. Amen. Amen. And I'm just so thankful for that. What a comforting comfort knowing that God is with us. And God is for us. No matter how dark it gets out there in the world, how many of y'all know God's already been to the end of this thing? And he's well able to take care of you. Well able to provide no matter what's going on in this world. Well able to protect you no matter how crazy it gets out there. Amen. And so we're just, we're just thankful. I don't know. I'm just thankful tonight. I don't even know if I'm making sense. I, I am inside. So you know, just leave me alone right now. Praise the Lord. I'm just grateful on the inside. But uh, I just want to thank Dr. Jacobs for coming again. We'll, of course, be min uh, he'll be ministering tomorrow night too. But we want to go ahead and receive an offering for him tonight. Amen. And so if you need an envelope for your giving, you can lift your hand. The ushers in the aisle and they'll serve you. If you're giving by cash, please take one of those and fill that out its entirety so that we can properly receipt you. Amen. And if you're giving by electronic giving, there's, uh, you can give that way as well. And uh, we're just thankful for what we're receiving. Amen. We're not buying anything. We're, we're uh, being grateful and we're thankful. You know, as Galatians said that, you know, when you're taught the word of God and you think about the revelation that you have and what God is doing in your life through other people and what you've learned over the years, how many of y'all know you can't buy it, but you can certainly appreciate it. And part of that appreciation, the Bible says to communicate it, and that means to give. And so you're giving to the ones, uh, you know, you're giving out of that place of gratitude and giving out of that place of love. And that's what we want to do. Amen. Amen. I want to give an offering tonight to Dr. Jacobs because we appreciate him. We value his ministry and um, we value what he's doing in the earth today. Amen. Praise the Lord. You need to put a value on that. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, hold your offering in your hand tonight. Father, we're so grateful tonight for all that you're doing in our lives and Lord you are worthy of it all and Lord as we give tonight we sow this offering to Dr. Jacobs uh, out of our love for him and out of our love for you and we're grateful for sending him to us and we're grateful for what we're learning and Lord we know we can't buy a blessing and we're not paying for anything 
we're giving out of the gratitude and the love of our heart. And so we do that in faith, believing that your word is true and you are multiplying our seed sown. And we thank you for it. And everybody said, I forgot to tell you, if you're making out a check, make it out to Church on the Rock and put it in the offering plate and we'll see to it. Put Dr. Jacobs' name on it uh, under the, in the bottom of it for Dr. Jacobs and we'll see to it that all that goes to him. Amen. Let's all stand up tonight if you would. Honor you are our God, the 
what we live for, we give you praise and all of the glory, God. Hallelujah. I was telling Josh, uh, this Josh right here, about that song. I think it was Sunday afternoon, and I was thinking about it at the hotel just 30 minutes ago or so, and you guys sang it. Thank you. <laughs> What a great song. Let's just thank him one more time. Father, we thank you. We love you. We thank you. You love us. You're abandoned yourself to us. You've inscribed us in the palms of your hands, you said. Each one of us. I don't know how you do it. I just believe it. I thank you. You're for us. You're with us. All the things we live through, go through, we get on the other side of it because of you. Not because we're so smart. Not because we did everything right. <laughs> we endeavored to do things right. But we know that you are got our back. And that you're helping us move forward in this life. And we're grateful. We're grateful. Let's just tell him we're thankful. Father, we're thankful. We're grateful. Open your mouth and tell him. We thank you, Father, for everything you're doing. Every way you're moving us forward. We bless you and praise you and thank you. And all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise belongs to you father doesn't belong to us you share it with us we thank you in some realms but we thank you it belongs to you because you're our creator and you're our father you're our god in jesus name we pray everybody said amen, amen. praise god you could be seated a minute wow <clears throat> i tell you you know i got letters i think last night or the night before from chastity and from duke they all wrote me letters, and I, I just appreciated that. I want to say to the congregation tonight, you know, the Lord spoke to me yesterday afternoon about praying for the children. And I was just awestruck by their sincerity, their tenderness of heart towards me, and the ones that I spoke something to, you know, I think they received it. And I appreciated the parents that you must be doing a good job teaching them or they wouldn't act like that. I mean, Dennis and Angie do their part, that's true, but... Uh, I want to give you this to make a copy, maybe for us for tomorrow or something to pass out. It's a warning sheet about visions and stuff <laughs> to give you some insight into what the Bible says about visions and stuff. You know, just because you have a vision doesn't mean it's of God. And I'm going to talk about some of the visions I had, and you don't have to believe it if you don't want, but I think you'd be wise to listen to me. Uh, and I didn't ask for any of them. Never to this day. I've never asked for a vision or a dream. I don't have dreams anyway. I've only had two or three in my life dreaming at night. I want to read you a couple of things. So I want to just thank the families that are here, the parents or the grandparents or whoever's helping you with your children. Your children are pretty spiritual kids. I mean, they're, some of them were just tiny. But they were so reverent towards the God up here. And they were, I could tell they respected me. I don't know how to say that correctly. I don't need to be respected, but I appreciated that. I don't demand that out of people because some people never get it. But your children really acted like they needed what I had. It made me feel special that God had spoke to me to minister to them. And I, if I remember right, every one of them that I said, do you pray in tongues yet? Yeah. They just nod their head, some of them. But I said, you go home and pray in tongues and then you get quiet. That's what I do with my life. I've done that for probably 40 years. And God always speaks to me. So I wanted to, it's going to take me two nights to get all this out. It'd probably take me six months to really get it all out. But I'm going to talk about angels tonight. And I'm so thrilled. You know, I, I'm a smart guy. When people are smart or smarter than me, I listen to them. This is from Charles Capps. I want to read just a paragraph or two. Angels are listening. Of course, I knew that because I've already studied my Bible, you know, 35, 40 years ago. I was praying one day and the Spirit of God began to speak to my spirit. Here are some of the things he said to me about angels and how they operate in our behalf. You've been wanting to know about confession. This is God speaking to Charles Capps. You've been speaking the word and putting it into motion. You've been saying what my word said. Now I'm going to share with you why it works. One reason it works for you to speak is so important is because the angels are listening to what you say. Now I knew that, but I mean just listen to this. He goes in more detail. Most people think, and this is the way I think most people think about it, uh, I tell the angels everything they are to do. Of course, I know that that's not true. 
But now I have one vision, and I think I'm going to share it tonight if I can get to it. It's the fourth vision in the line of visions that I talk about. I mean, I've had more than seven or eight visions in my life, but these are the main ones I'm going to talk about tonight. The first four, and then tomorrow night we'll take the other four or three or whatever it is. I want you to listen to me here. Most people think that I tell the angels everything they are to do. Now, in this one vision, when they came, they said, we've been sent. I didn't talk to them about it. didn't ask for their help. I was messed up at that point in my life. I know you've probably been messed up a few times, too. And you went to church. I was the pastor of the church, and I was really confused and depressed. And I don't mind telling you that I'm not depressed constantly. I'm not depressed at all anymore. I mean, very seldom, you know. When my, my wife passed away, it wasn't easy to deal with, but God helped me to deal with it. I'm on the other side of it. Amen. You know, very seldom do I break down and have a, you know, a crying thing. Uh, anyway, most of the time it's you that are giving them their assignment. I want you to listen to that. Most of the time it's you giving them, the angels, your, the assignment. Now, you can't just make up stuff in your head. And I can't either, I'm not that smart. But I can go to my Bible and find out what I could say scripturally, biblically, right. to them. And I tell you, they are listening to the word. They're not listening to unbelief. Amen. They're not listening to God help me. Well, I got God to help you. But I mean, you just can't make up something and expect the angels to do it. It may be against God's will. It may be anti-scriptural. Though it sounds good to some people. Even people get emotional about it. That don't make it real because you're emotional. Right. Yes, sir. You know, okay. And he said, this is what he went on to say, I designed them, God speaking to Charles Capps, I designed them as ministering spirits. They stand beside you daily, listening to the words that come out of your mouth. If your words are in line with my word, then the angels have an assignment and they go to work in your behalf. But if you speak things that are contrary to my word, you won't get an audience with the angels and they won't operate on those words. Words spoken contrary to my word will hinder the angels from working in your behalf. So you could say things, but if you don't say the right things, they're just going to stop. They're going to just fold their wings or fold their hands and just not do anything for you if you talk wrong to them. How many of you are understanding? Well, I'm not correct, and I'm giving you some guidance. <laughs> okay. All right. Because they are designed as ministering spirits to minister to you. They listen to your words to see if your words agree with my word. My word is my will for man. That's everybody here. You know, you're of the race of man. Yes, Women and men are different. But we're still of the race of man. If a tiger ran through here today, you wouldn't check its gender. You'd just say, that's a tiger. Yeah. <laughs> okay. yes, my word is my will for man. So I'm talking to the ladies here as well as the men. Yes, yeah, my word is my will for man. You should always speak in line with my word in order for my will, God's will, to come to pass in your life. Man was designed to speak truth, and my word is truth. That's powerful. Then I, I'm going to ask you to pray with me in just a minute if you can agree with me. If you can't, don't talk. Don't, don't try to just pretend you believe. But if you believe with me, I'm going to read something else. This is from Pastor Nancy. Uh, and pa Pastor Everly, he had her at his church, and he gave me this later. Um, she said that the Spirit said to her, by saying that there are angels that work with you in the healing ministry, and by telling people about the angels that work with your ministry, by giving them the proper attention, the angels, you know, I might not see them tonight, but they're here. All of them that belong to me, they're with me. Okay, I'm just, I'm just telling you what I know. And I never send two of them to do anything apart from me because they're protecting me. Maybe I'll get into a little bit of that tomorrow night, I don't know. I'll tell a funny story on me in a minute. So she said, it's good to say, if you have a healing ministry, that telling the people about the angels that work with your ministry, I didn't get into this very much at all with you. Now, you probably some of you heard me teach this before, but that doesn't mean you understand it yet. I hope you do, but I know for me, I'm just talking about me, I'm not pointing this to you. It takes me time to digest things. And, as I, and this is what I've learned in my life as an older man. I'm not old, but I'm older than when I was 26. You know, I don't have 70 years now to live in this planet. I got, you know, whatever I'm believing for if the Lord tarries. And that's private between me and him. But anyway, you get it, what I'm saying. And I found out the older I get, the more I meditate on God. Instead of just reading scriptures, I do read scriptures. I teach, I study. If you listen to me, you'd know I know a little something about this subject anyway. 
don't know everything about it. And this is what she was saying here. You give them attention and recognize uh, by telling people that they're here, you give them permission to do what they came to do. That's the angels. And you have a part in that too. They can do more. Now this is critical, I think. I, didn't, I read this five or six times before I caught this. They can do more if the people release their faith for them to work. But you have to tell the people about them working with your ministry for them to have faith. You know, you have to tell everybody about everything if you're going to have faith in it. I mean, if you're a preacher of the word. I hope you're listening. This is, this is power. And earlier in this, you know, I wasn't even in the meeting. She was in, I think, Pastor Everly's church. She was at the hotel praying. Of course, I, I went to her church way back in 2011, I think, and taught on angels for four services, I think it was. And I said, angels that are on the earth, they don't go to heaven with us. We don't need them up there. You've got a heavenly limo service coming for you. Two angels will come take you home when you're ready to go. But the angel that protected you in the earth, he don't, he don't have a job up there. There's nothing to protect you from. And I said, they all stay in the earth. If this is where their assignment is, this is where they belong. I'm just telling you what I've learned after 40, 42 years of teaching this subject. Take it or leave it, whatever you want to do. But, and so anyway... But she went and prayed and said, God, what about those hundred healing angels? That, and she calls him Ed. I understand that. I call him doctor. What did you do with those hundred healing angels? Well, I'm going to give you 50, Pastor Nancy. And I'm going to divide the other up, the other 50, among some of his sons. And she mentioned Ricky Edwards, Dr. Jacobs, and Pastor Jay Everly. So I'm one of them. And I asked the Lord just out of curiosity. You know, I think most people are kind of curious. I won't use the word nosy. <laughs> I just did, didn't I? Everybody wants to know about everything. But uh, when he didn't respond to me, then I figured I didn't need to know that. See, as I've grown in the Lord over the years, I used to tease the congregation. I said, if you won't use your angel, I'm going down to the unemployment office. I'm taking them. I know how to work, work them. And then God started adding angels into my ministry. True story. 2008, I inherited eight more angels. And then after later, Pastor Nancy had that. She, somebody sent me the tape about it. And this, it's mentioned in this article, too. I'm not being a big shot. I'm just telling you what happened. And what kind of angels are they got, that I got from Dr. Dufresne? Healing angels. Some angels are prosperity angels. And he, you don't have to know all that to release them. And somebody, you know, people ask the strangest questions when you let them run loose in a meeting. One lady asked me in a ladies meeting in, I don't know where I was at now, Hershey, Pennsylvania, does that sound right? Yeah. Somewhere around there. The lady said, do I have to know my angel's name to get him to go? And I wanted to go off on her, but I was really sweet. <laughs> I wanted to say, who told you that? Right. Where did you read that? No, you don't have to know your angel's name. If you did, there'd be two Bibles, one on the Bible scriptures and one on their names. Now, if some people, I know Brother Hagin, he knew a couple of the names of angels, but I don't think that has anything to do with what I'm teaching. So I'm just, I stay simple. If you tell me you don't understand me, I need to pray for your brain because you are very complicated way out there. I'm not an intellectual. I'm not trying to impress you with anything. I'm just me. <laughs> All right. And then she went on to say, you know, if I tell you about it and you have faith with me for the angels that you may not see, I don't always see them unless it's necessary. And sometimes I don't even mention it to some people. Because, you know, people, I don't know, they, they get weird about stuff like this. I do my best to stay very normal. Sometimes I say an angel's doing, putting something in you there. Some angel just took something out of you. Or whatever. Like a bad part. Put a new heart in a lady one time and put some other things in different people. She went on to say, just, I'm going to just wrap this up real tight. Just like Jesus told Brother Hagin that he had to tell the people that Jesus had appeared to him and placed the finger of his hand in the palm of his hands, in Brother Hagin's hands, and he had an anointing to heal the sick and uh, <clears throat> so forth, and said, so the ministry of angels, as Pastor Nancy, won't work without you telling the people that, here, that there are angels that work with you. You know, I hope you understand what I'm saying. I'm going to say it so clear. If you misunderstand it, you just need to quit coming to church. I'm not trying to impress you. You listen to me? See, but you have to realize this. 
the ministry of angels won't work without you telling the people that there are angels that work with you. I'm just stating a fact. I'm not trying to impress anybody. Right. Yes, sir. You know, I'm just talking to you here. And she said, you know, they have healing power and they, they work with our healing power in our endowments. I have a healing endowment. I mentioned that a little bit last night. Didn't get into it too far. But then she, I'm going to stop after this reading these couple scripture, a couple lines here. Just like healing power can be present in a service, but without someone responding to it, it won't work. Now, I, you know, Richard Roberts has been here, hadn't he? And normally he doesn't lay hands on people. He just calls it out. But that's not my ministry. So if I started doing that, I'd get rebuked. Unless I just specifically, I call out things word of knowledge. But a lot expects me to lay hands on people too, because that's where my power is at. If I have any from God, it's in my hands. And he dealt with me about it three times. And he said, last time, I don't want to ever have to talk to you about this again in the planet. Do you understand me, Michael? I was already crying. And I am so sorry. I don't know what I was thinking. Well, you weren't thinking. You know, God can be stuff, tough if he needs to be when you're just hard-headed like I was. I didn't realize I was being hard-hearted or, you know, whatever, but I got rebuked and I said, I receive it. I won't let that go by now. I will get my hands on people when I can. Now, in some cases, maybe I can't, you know, in some settings. People are in prison, sometimes I can't get into my hands on them. But just like healing power can be present in the service with, without someone responding to it, it won't work. So angels that work with your endowments can be present in a service, but unless you respond to them, they can't work. No, that's all I'm going to say. I'm going to let that go. I've said enough stuff from other people here, but just an interesting thought, and I think it's helpful for us sometimes. Are you with me? <laughs> Again, don't be concerned about all these notes. <laughs> Let's go over, first of all, to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 13 and 14, I think is what we want here. Just to, just to lay a little foundation for us. And, you know, I'll try not to wear you out. I, I realize I went really long two services in a row, and I apologize for that. Uh, you know, I know I get carried away, and you're such a receptive group. I would say this is one of the most receptive churches I go to. There's a few others. But you guys just draw it out of me. Maybe not everybody here. You mean to judge yourself if you're putting up a resistance. Maybe the rest of us are pushing it down. You know, I'm just talking. I tell a funny story on myself. God kept dealing with me about going in this Catholic bookstore. I'm really just a believer. You know, when I got filled with the Spirit, my wife, it's funny, I don't want to tell that story all the way through, but we were going to a bookstore that day, and my wife looked at me. I got filled with the Spirit on a Saturday morning about 7 o'clock, reading, uh, what's his name, Dennis Bennett's book, he's an Episcopalian. And I'm in a Baptist seminary at that moment. But somebody told me about his book, and I said, you know, I need to get that. And they said, we're going to the bookstore today. You want us to get you one, Michael? I said, yeah, I do. I'll see you Tuesday at school. But they came about an hour later knocked on the door. We were in your neighborhood. I read about five pages that night, and then we had guests coming for dinner, my wife and I. So I couldn't, you know, read while you have guests. That's pretty rude. <laughs> But when we grabbed hands to pray at the end of the night, just send, you know, just praying over them and sending them. I think I could have spoken tongues right then, but I was a little intimidated. My wife didn't know uh, that I was moving in that direction yet. <laughs> so the next morning, I got up at 7 o'clock, went in the back bedroom, and I, I read about three or four more pages of Dennis Bennett's book, Episcopalian guy. Very intelligent man, but very simple. And I said, that guy makes perfect sense to me. God, I got on my knees. I said, Father, I want it. I need it. And then I said something, I normally don't talk like this. I said, I don't care who it removes me from or sends me to. Boy, that came true. I was prophesying over myself. I didn't realize that that was what I was doing. Man, people that used to love me, they hated me after that. You know, a young guy gets sent off to uh, a Southern Baptist seminary and comes back spirit field, speaks in tongues, prays for the sick. And I told you about those three leaders that tried to correct me and make fun of me and make me, you know, like I was a dummy. And I just said, well, I'm not going to give it up. I don't think, you know, I appreciate you men. I know you're trying to warn me, but I've already experienced it. So, you know, I can't go back. Anyway, I'm going to the bookstore. I tell this real quick. My wife's sitting there. <laughs> she looks at me. She goes, what's that silly looking grin on your face for? 
I said, I'm not going to tell you. She said, Michael Jacobs, you tell me right now. <laughs> a, wife, a good wife will do that to you sometimes. Yes, I said, well, I spoke in tongues this morning. She said, what? <laughs> <laughs> we had a Bible in our uh, glove from Martin, threw it on the dash. You show me in there. I said, I got one verse I can show you. That's all I know. Acts 2.4, read it. And so she read it. And we got in a lively discussion at the bookstore in the driveway. <laughs> oh, we didn't get out of the car for 30 minutes. <laughs> so she says to me, if she's talking, she's kind of upset about it. Well, what are we now? <laughs> and this is what I said. I don't know about you, but I'm a believer. <laughs> That's what I am. I'm a believer. And you are too, honey. And, you know, she uh, put up a good fight for a few minutes, but then she said, I know you, Michael Jacobs, you're not a flake. So I don't understand what you're talking about at all. I've, I've never tried to do that. I wasn't interested in that. I said, well, I got interested because I was hungry Amen. for the th things of God. And it led me to a Presbyterian, I mean, a uh, Episcopalian guy <laughs> that writes books. And later, I haven't met him yet. I'm going to give him a big hug in heaven because he really helped me to see things. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay, now let's go here to Hebrews 1, 13 and 14. It says, but to which of the angels said he at any time, sit on my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool? He didn't say that to angels. He's bringing a comparison. That's what the book of Hebrews is all about. Old Testament stuff and New Testament stuff. And of course, always remember the New Testament is much more powerful. Everything about the blood's more powerful. The name is more powerful. I know God had compound names we sang about it, Jehovah Nissi, Jehovah Tiskanu, and all that stuff. And that's, I know a couple words. Anyway. <laughs> but the name of Jesus is what we got today. And that doesn't belong to him, it belongs to us. He gave it to us. Like we were just singing, it belongs to him. The glory does, but you can do things. Anyway. So he's given a comparison. Then he picks up the concept of angels in verse 14. That's why I'm bringing this out to show you this. He didn't say that to an angel. An angel doesn't have that level of authority like Jesus has. You do know that, right? The angels don't even have our level of authority. Now, they can do some things that I can't do in the healing ministry. I've seen them reach inside people's bodies and put something in there or pull something out. I saw an angel one time, a lady fell out that had scoliosis. She's laying on her back. And I went on ministering to other people. Then the Lord said, turn around, look at it. He stuck his hand right through this part of her body and grabbed her tailbone and jerked it. And I saw that spine straighten right out. We've done a lot of things like that in my life. I'll tell you about it some, a couple of them and we'll go through here. So let me read verse 14 for us first. Are they, referring to the angels, are they the angels? Are they not all ministering spirits? They all have a job description. If you don't know it, I don't know it either sometimes, but they all have a purpose and they all have a certain job description we might call it. You know, I have a job description. My job description is more about that other world that's unseen, not the seen world. I know I'm in a seen world. I can see your, your body. I can't see you because you're inside there. But at the same time, I do a lot of teaching on deliverance and angelic beings because that's the thing people can't see. And sometimes it throws people for a loop because they can't see it. They don't believe it. And by the way, that's not faith. <laughs> if you have to see it to believe it, it's not faith. <laughs> faith is the substance of things not seen. Okay. All right. Not seen as yet. But if you're really in faith, you will see it. That's the counterpart to that. But, so it says, are they not all ministering spirits? I've went to all the different ranks of angels, different archangels, uh, seraphim, cherubims, and regular general angels, I would call them. I call them personal angels, I like that better, the angels assigned to people, but all, every class in that area I've found, they all minister to somebody in this planet. You know, remember, I think it was the seraphim in Isaiah 6, you know, he said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up in his train, his robe filled the temple, and I saw the seraphim flying around the throne, crying, holy, 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 and they're powerful beings. And, and the, the doorpost in the temple, the heavenly temple, vibrate at their voice. They're so powerful. Wow. And then one of them broke rank and went over to the altar and took a hot coal and came down on the earth and put it on Isaiah's lips. Now listen now, he didn't get blisters either. You think with me a little, this is spiritual. And, and I know I was at her ordination. I, didn't, I, wasn't, I was expecting God to use me. 
Pastor Randy's her husband, and Pastor Alvin, you know him, Alvin Parker, he was there, and his wife, and I had you and him pray with me over her. And then I, I backed away from her for a minute, and I said, you guys go ahead and pray for her. And all of a sudden, this angel came around Pastor Parker's side, and he said, put this on her lips. It was a hot coal. It wasn't hot to the touch, but it looked like it was on fire. And I just went, hit her in her lips, and she fell out. Then a healing anointing hit me. See, if you don't obey God, sometimes that never happens. You don't get to phase two. <laughs> that's the end of the service. God bless you. We'll see you. You know what I mean? But now that's because I'm used to working with them. I'm not bragging about it. And it's taken God 42 years to get me to this place. I didn't learn it in three weeks, three months, or three years, or even 30 years. I've been 42 years preaching on angels. I just want you to know that. I'm not trying to impress you because I still don't know everything about them. But I wanted you to see that. And it says, they've been sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. I like to read it this way because that was 2,000 years ago, thereabouts. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who are the heirs of salvation? If you're saved, you're an heir of salvation. But that's telling us how much God was concerned with us. Like me, I was a drug addict. I was, not a, I was really out there. And I'm, you know, I hate to say some things to you because it's, well, it's just not very nice to talk about. But, you know, I wasn't a very nice person back then, and I was really evil. I mean, I was doing the drugs and all that, and constantly for three years. So that made me a mess. Now, I wanted, to, I wanted you to see that, though, that these spirits are given to us to minister for us. And one day I saw that word for, and the Lord said, you ever seen that before? And I said, evidently not. Talk on to me. Because I had read it, but I didn't get it. He said, sometimes you say the angels are to minister uh, to you. I said, well, that's true too, isn't it? And he said, yeah, but four is a bigger word. And he used Del Tillett. Del, raise your hand over here. There's Del Tillett. That's Rebecca's daddy. And he's been working for me for 40-some years. And I like shredders. I won't take you down the whole trail of it. <laughs> you know I like them, don't you? But I told him, I burnt three of them up. But I said, get me a bigger one. Not that I could put a piano in, but at least going to take the load I put in it. He had a credit card from church. He, I was on a mission trip. He went down to the office depot or whatever it's called, bought me a uh, shredder, and came to my house, had a key, got in, went to my office, plugged it in, took it out of the box and all that, see if it worked, and he just left it. What a deal. Now, listen, that's what, in some ways, that's what an angel is. He's assigned to you, and you're supposed to get him to work for you in reality. And they will do what you say if you say what's in the Bible or have some very, you know, have some uh, definitive thing like that. Now, before I go any further on this tonight, I want you, let's read verses 1 through 4 of chapter 2. And remember, that didn't have the word chapter in the beginning. All these letters were just written. It says, therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard. What are we talking about, angels? At least at any time we let them slip. And one translation says, they fade away from you. If the word spoken by angels was steadfast, every transgression and disobedience of people, that's what it's talking about, received a just recompense and reward. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? God also bearing them witness both with signs and wonders and different kinds of miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost. That could be translated uh, distributions of the Holy Ghost or maybe even endowments according to his own will. So we're, we're, I'm just bringing this to you and then I'm going to move on here. The ministry of angels has within that signs and wonders and various miracles that happen. And then it helps the people with endowments too or distributions of the Holy Ghost. You don't get to have more of the Holy Ghost or less of the Holy Ghost. I mentioned that last night if you were listening because different ministry gifts require different equipment. You know, you know what I'm saying. You know, sometimes you've got a big hill in your backyard. You can't get it down with a little bobcat. You need a dozer. <laughs> you start that puppy up and it just takes the whole yard out. <laughs> so you have different levels of power and authority with them. Okay. But I want to say a couple of things back in verse 14 before I move on from that. First of all, in the Webster, the original Webster's Dictionary, it's about this thick, probably weighs about 25 pounds. I think Pastor Alvin bought me a copy. I was wanting one. I had that little red collegiate dictionary, but what America has done is taken out all his scriptures 
which he had by all the references in his original dictionary. So I looked in there, his, regi- his original Webster's Dictionary is about that thick. And it said to give aid, or this word ministering right here, says to give aid or service to the sick. So that tells us immediately, if you're thinking with me, angels must have some ability in healing to some level to do that with the people they're assigned to. Right. All right. And then it says, uh, and then the Greek, I looked up the Greek word, it says to, pu- pu- to function publicly as a benefit. I remember I was in a meeting in Virginia. I don't know how many years ago that's been now, maybe 12, maybe 15. And a guy was speaking. You know, I was one of the speakers, about five or six of us. I came in that morning and was at the lunch, and he taught at. When he got done teaching, he did a great job. He came back to the table where all the preachers were. He said, hi, I'm Jerry McGee. I said, I'm Michael Jacobs. He said, you know, I have problems with my spine. I said, no, I didn't know that. Did somebody tell you I had an anointing for that? No. I said, well, I do. I'm not going to play like it's a word to knowledge. Are you coming to my meeting tonight? I'm preaching tonight. you coming? Yeah. Okay, if you want me to, I'll pray for you. When I get to the point I shut my Bible and start ministering, I'll call you out, and I'm not going to pretend it's a word of knowledge because you just told me you had a bad spine. I will come back to you, or you'll come with me, and I'll lay hands on you, and that anointing will go in to straighten all that out. Well, he came to the meeting. He's about halfway back. I don't even, I don't even remember if he had a Bible. He never looked at it. He was looking at me, and, he, and the longer I went, the meaner he looked. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm thinking maybe I'm... I'm taking care of his field crooked because he maybe don't believe that. I'm not sure what he's thinking. I didn't know the guy the first time I met him was at lunch, and I did, we didn't stay and talk all afternoon. We dismissed after lunch, and we went to our rooms or whatever we did, and I came back that night and started preaching. I look, kept looking at him. The more I preached, the, the more meaner his face looked. So I said, Jerry, come on out, and I, I walked back to him. I laid hands on his head, and I stepped back from him. And I said, there's that annoying for your spine. And all of a sudden, an angel came. Whoop! Angel came around to my right hip, and he stuck his finger down here in his body, in his lower abdomen, and he started rolling something. I said, "Jerry, that angel's rolling something inside you." He he turned around and ran out of the meeting. I'm at a Marriott hotel. I don't know what he's going. Is he going home? Is he going to his room? What? I thought I really ticked this guy off. That's what I thought, you know, because he looked so grumpy when I was preaching. So you know, I just let people do their thing, and I don't let that distract me from what I'm doing. You know, so just know that. If you run out, that's fine. I'll just administer to those that are left. <laughs> you got to think right. You, you know, people will upset you. You know, if you just go by their faces. Sometimes I've pre- preached to people, I thought, that guy, if he got anything, I'm, I don't know. But then he come up to me after the service or two weeks later and said, you know, that time you was preaching on that, you probably, look, I wasn't paying attention, but I was paying a lot of attention, and it's did this and did that in my life. Anyway, I went on and pray, prayed for a few people, and he came back in. This is the way he came back in. <laughs> he came in the back door of our meeting hall. <laughs> I said, Jerry, what has happened to you? He said, I guess you thought I was uh, upset with you. I said, yeah, it crossed my mind a few times. He said, you didn't know this. I have had a kidney stone for three days. I haven't been able to use the restroom. And when you said that angel's moving something, rolling, he was rolling that stone. I went in the men's room right outside the back door of that Marriott Hotel conference room, right into the men's room and passed that stone. He said, I'm free, I'm free, I'm free. (laughs) Hallelujah. I bet you didn't think of that this morning. Angels could roll out kidney stones. They do a lot of things. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, and I, I like to tell you about a lot of people, but I better just move on. Now, I'm going to tell you about a lady in Honduras, Miriam Cabrera is her name. This was quite a few years ago. I don't remember what year it was, maybe 15, 20 years maybe. And her and her husband owned a restaurant in Tegucigalpa, which is in Honduras. It's where I flew into. And they always wanted to invite us over for dinner at their house with my group. Whoever was with me on that trip, they came with me. My five or six or whatever. Most of them were pastors. There might have been some just general members of the church that went with me too. But I'd ministered to her the night before. Actually, I ministered to people who had something with their spines messed up. And there must have been 200 people there in the meeting. And about 40 of them came forward. And I got to her and the Lord said, hit her kind of hard in the head. Well, I didn't hit her like that. I just like that. And she just stood there. And so I went on. You know, I'm not waiting for people to fall out or anything. But the next day, I'm at her house going to have lunch. And she said, Dr. Jacobs, you sit here. And the other pastor that I was connected to then, he said, you sit there. 
And she said, I want to talk to you about what happened to me last night. I said, I'd be interested. No, I know you got in line for some kind of spinal issue, right? Yeah, but she sat down with me. Her husband's cooker, and he's a chef. He's in the kitchen. She said, you know, I fell as a six-year-old girl and cracked my tailbone. And she said, as I grew further, you know, the six, and I grew up, I, I got married, I had three children, and that affected it. And then she said, you know, I got so bad, I couldn't even take the kids to school without having to stop once or twice and get out of the van, walk around it, because it was in so much pain. And she said, last night when you touched me, you touched my head, I, she said, I felt a hand beneath that place where it's cracked because the pain was right there and wrapping around her. And the hand above it, and it went like that and said, all the pain left me. <laughs> well, naturally, that wasn't me. I would never put my hands anywhere close to somebody in that area as a person. You know yeah. what I mean. Yes, but she, she said that that angel did that to her and said, I don't have any pain. And I had, a, I had a lady in my church. She's not with me right now, but she was a missionary down there. And she went back after 20 years. I said, if you run into Miriam, ask her how she's been since we prayed for her. She said, I've never had another symptom. Right. Tell Dr. Yeah. Jacob that. Right. Yeah. So angels do all kinds of stuff. And then I was in my own church preaching. Uh, of course, a lot back then I was the pastor. But I, this one lady in my church, she's kind of a young lady then, 20-something maybe. I said, come up here, I want to pray for you. Well, I don't even know what I was praying for about. I just laid hands on her and said, I don't know what to pray in English. Just started praying in tongues. She just stood there, you know, with reverently, you know, receiving. And I went down this way praying for some other people. The Lord said, turn around and look. Well, I turned around and look, and there's an angel on the first step. And she's facing him. He's pulling something out of her stomach. Not up here, not down there, out of her stomach. And it just looked like trash. And, that, and that's what I saw. I said, oh, my gosh, I didn't know that was in her. And so I didn't say anything to her at that moment because what, I don't even know what it is. It just looks like yuck. That's the best way I know to say it. Yuck, I'll be sweet about it. And he was pulling something out of her stomach. And, and so I got home, and I was having a sandwich with my wife and my daughter, and I told him what I saw that night, and my daughter broke into tears, said, Dad, didn't you know that about her? She struggles with bulimia and anorexia. I said, I didn't know anything about that. Nobody told me that. But I saw that angel taking care of that that night. That's what it was. So I called her on the phone, this is Pastor Jacob, so-and-so. I'll tell you what I saw. And then she burst into tears, and she's 40-some years old now, never had another problem. Now, I don't know, you know, you didn't know bulimia and anorexia could be healed that way. I just saw it, and she told me she was healed, and she'd never struggle with that again. You know, the devil works on people, men and women. Yes, if he can make you feel like you've got to be a certain size to be approved, you're done. Yes, I mean, the devil will torment you until you get him out yes. and <laughs> rebuke him. Yes, Amen. And he uses men that way, too, anymore. I think some of the men feel like they're not quite up to par. Okay, nobody's saying nothing. That's okay. I'm not going to get you up to par. That'd have to be God to get you up to par, but I was talking. Then I had a lady in my church. Her and her husband got married a little bit later in life, maybe 35, 38, I don't remember. And they tried to have a baby for about five years, and nothing was working, so they both went to doctors, female doctor, a male doctor. And they came to see me, wanted to come see me, and they said, you know, we've both been to doctors, and they said, there's no way we're going to have a baby. Both of us are messed up. I said, well, first I said, well, you ever thought about adoption? Yeah, but we don't like, we don't, we don't feel like that's what we should do. We want our own baby. I said, okay, I'm going to lay hands on your head and pray for God to heal you. And I laid hands on both of them in my office. They kept trying. I don't know how long that lasted, several months, maybe a year. And then one Sunday I came to church and I had a word. I think it was depression. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> anyway, this lady got in the line over here in my altar area. And I touched her once in the head like that. And a whirlwind came around me and threw her back. Now, I'm not exaggerating. She was, let me get through here, and I'll show you how far she went. She's in the aisle. We have an aisle here. She's about 15 feet from me. And her, she's still standing erect. I didn't see her feet move. That's how fast. It went, shoop, like, like suck, that wind just sucks her back. And she just ended up back here. And then I saw something. Then I said, her name was Patty. I said, Patty, there's an angel there. He's ministered you. He's got his hand inside your body. Now, I didn't see anything nasty, so just to help you understand. But I saw him fixing something down there. I don't know what the thing was he fixed, but he fixed it because she got pregnant the next, next month. <laughs> 
That kid's about 25 years old now. Hallelujah. Just talk, giving a little detail to this. Some of these stories take a long time. I've already been preaching 35 minutes. Yeah, I'm just trying to see what I need to do here. Then I was down at Pastor Maria Rancun's church in uh, Manzanillo, Mexico. Oh, I didn't tell you about my Catholic bookstore. I got to tell you that for I started. I went somewhere, didn't I? But God kept dealing with me about going by this Catholic bookstore. I said, I want you to go in there and shop. You want me to shop in a Catholic bookstore? Okay. So I, I remembered I had an apocrypha one time. That's the books that the Catholics believe between the Old and New Testament. And I thought, well, I'd be in, I'll study on angels, see what they say about it. And I, was, and I got an apocrypha. And then I was getting ready to check out, and the computer broke. And the lady said, you know, because there's another couple of people in front of me, said, would you mind me taking you later? Because they were here first, and the computer busted or something, and they're going to fix it, and it's going to be okay in a few minutes. I said, fine, there's some things over in this glass cabinet I see I'd like to go look at. There was, they had some statues of angels over there. Now, I'm getting ahead of myself, I think. I think you'll understand. But in 2008, I had an angel. Well, eight angels came to me, but this one defended me. They didn't have any armament on when they flew in, in the vision. I'll talk about that tomorrow night in more detail. But this creature came over a hill, turned to my left in that vision. And my wife said I was gone for 35 minutes. I was at the altar, but I, I really wasn't there. Because when I started going somewhere, I said, Lord, am I in heaven? He said, no, but pay attention. I want to show you something. All right. So eight angels flew in. They knelt not by me. They weren't worshiping me, and you're forbidden from worshiping angels. So if any creature comes to you and said, you need to worship me, you just tell him to go to you know where. <laughs> not heaven. <laughs> and uh, I don't know that you can send them there anyway, but you know, I just know what I'm talking about. And so I got over that glass case there, and finally the lady got done with them. And this angel is what I want to say. They just came in a, in a it's like chain mall, I think they say, like, a, like old and the sword fight stuff that looks like a chain link fence, but it's real tight. They all had on the same outfit from right up here all the way to the floor. They didn't have any armor, no axes, no swords, no shields, nothing. And all of a sudden I looked at my, kind of in my left peripheral vision, this creature came over this knoll, this little hill. And when he first came, I saw his face first. He was a demonic creature. Oh, my gosh. I mean, if I'd have been in fear, it would have scared something out of me. It was intense. And he was bigger than anything I'd ever seen before. And he, when he saw me, when we caught eyes, he, he jumped over that hill and he started running towards me, like full speed. I don't know. It seemed like he was a, I don't know, like he had a jet engine on him or something. I don't know how he moved so quick. And I was trying to say, I'm out. I'm in the spirit. I'm in a different dimension. I'm not in heaven. Don't ask me where I was. But I had a vision. And all of a sudden, this guy down at my right foot, he stood up and he had a bow and he had a quiver, a quiver on his back, and he went, shoo, hit that creature, and he dissolved. You remember the old etch sketches Little red things you gave to your kids? They could play for hours and be very wonderful. <laughs> 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 And I said to the Lord out loud, you can't kill a devil with an arrow, can you? He said, he can. And what about this creature? He said, this is the kind of creature that's going to come after you now, Michael, because of the prophet's ministry. I didn't know whether to thank him or, or, or just give my resignation. <laughs> no. I said, okay, so what's, what's with this guy? You know, I don't know about you. I ask questions. I'm a pretty good learner. I'm a good student. And I said, I thought you gave me an angel when I first got here. He said, you did. He's the one that came when you were crippled. I said, yeah, I remember him. And you told me, I asked him, I didn't ask him for 20 years. But finally I asked him, who's he anyway? He said, he's your guardian angel since from the beginning. He's still with you. But this one, he's to help you now in the prophet's ministry. The only thing he's going to do is defend you. I don't know about you. It gave me a great sense of comfort. Because that creature was some kind of a monster. And he was big. He looked like a gorilla from the neck down, but he had a head on him out of some weird movie or something. Okay, I'm just talking to you. So I go in that bookstore, Catholic bookstore, and I see this guy on the third shelf, but I can't reach it. So she comes over, can I help you? I said, could you, maybe this little footstool here, could you take that guy that's, his back is not to me. I want to see his back. And he had a quiver and he had his hand going. 
I said, I know that guy. He helped me one time. <laughs> and the people, the Catholics, they were going, <laughs> let's go, Henry. I'm going home. <laughs> I forgot where I was at. I know that guy. He delivered me one time. <laughs> and the Catholics were scattering everywhere. <laughs> That's my funny story. <laughs> and I bought it. I bought that figurine. I bought one more, too. But anyway, <laughs> kind of funny, I thought. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. You're going to have to help me here. Oh, gosh, it's already 40. How do you do that to me? Okay, let me, let me read this real quick, and then I'll get on into some <laughs> other things. But that, and I didn't realize where it was at until I saw people scattered. <laughs> Man, they were trying to get away from me. I just, I just thought I was talking, but they heard me. <laughs> I know that guy. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, they were running for cover. Get away from that guy. He's nuts. I'm not nuts. It really happened, and I, know, I don't know his name either, but he helps me. Yeah, in 2017, man, I had a couple issues where I think it was two times in that year. I felt like there was... Um, what do you have when you, like the mafia, they put a hit on me or somebody put a hit on me or something. It was odd. I, I just felt uneasy. And so I took authority over it and rebuked it and it went away. And it happened two times in that year, I'm thinking. And so in December, I said to the Lord, Lord, I want to thank you for delivering me those two times. I guess that guy with the bow took care of that. He said he sure did. But there were six times. Wow. Then I felt ignorant. He said, why does it matter if it was six or 60? I told you he'd take care of it. Yeah. I said, you sure did. Hey, thank you, Father. I don't thank the angel. I thank the Father for sending those angels to defend me. Yeah. Then I listened to Dad, and he told me a story about himself as a prophet, that he had something similar happen to him a few years before that, where God put an extra angel in charge of defending him. In a way, just, you know, it sounds like I'm a storybook, but I'm not. A, you know, you go to hell for lying. It's in the book of Revelation. You can read it, about, about chapter 21 or something, all kinds of stuff. So I'm not trying, and I'm not a person that stretches things. Amen. All right. Now I wanted to read just a little part of this. Uh, well, I'm just going to let that go for now because of my time. Let's do this. Let's go over to 2 Corinthians. I wanted to give you a little foundation for what I'm going to teach you and talk to you about. Three or four visions real quick here. that I wanted to see, as you see in the Bible that it does talk about visions. And uh, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 1, 2, and uh, let me see, I might read verse 3 too. Well, okay, let's see. Verse 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. It is not expedient for me, doubtless to glory. I will come to visions, plural, and revelations of the Lord. And this is Paul writing, and I think he's writing it as a prophet and certainly an apostle. But sometimes it's given to people to have those things. I didn't ask for it. I'm trying to help you see. I don't go to God and ask for things that are way out there. I never have done that. I don't know how I kept myself from doing it, but I just never did. And all of a sudden they started coming very, uh, not like they do today, that's like 40 years later, 50 years later. I mean, things happen more readily to me in that area. I don't, I don't have a vision. Let me say something here to help you clear your thinking. I wouldn't want to see what's going on every day in every situation. And see that spirit world. Because it's full of devils. And it's full of angels. But you have to realize that there, there are creatures that are invisible in this planet. The Bible teaches that. I know you're wondering where it's at. I'm going to teach you, tell you in a minute. But let's see with this a minute. He said, uh, verse 2, I knew a man. So, so Paul is saying, this is what I want to say, visions, plural, and revelations. Now, see, I have, I have some revelations primarily in the area of angels. And I have some other visions primarily in the angel of devils. Not as many as I have about the angels, but I do see things because God gave me the gift of discerning of spirits. That doesn't mean I say into the evil world all the time. That's what I meant. I wouldn't want to have to deal with that. Maybe you think you're bigger, tougher, stronger. You might be, but I'm just telling you what I know. I wouldn't want to have to see into that world constantly with all the stuff that's out there. You know, if you go by a bar at night and you saw that, you'd see devils going in and out trying to encourage people to get, get sinful. You go by a club, people dance and all that. I'm just going to be sweet with it and say that. And then there's demons there. Yeah. And they will try to get in you if you go in there. 
and they didn't have it, people, after a while. All right, I'm just giving a little, that's what I'm saying. And it says, so he had, so I don't have scriptures for this, what I'm teaching, but I have a revelation of angels now. That doesn't mean I'm super something. It just means I've studied them long enough that I know they're always out there in the unseen realm unless they come and prepare to me and talk to me, which many have. I'm going to share that in just a minute. Are you listening? Paul said he had visions, plural, and revelations. So that's pretty, I mean, he was really a spiritual giant in his day. I knew a man in Christ, I believe he's referring to himself, above 14 years ago, whether in the body, I cannot tell, or whether out of the body. I read that one time, I had no idea what he's talking about, but now in my life, I'm 73, I've had a lot of times where I was out of my body. And I told you a little bit about it the other day. I said, if I came out of my body and stood here, uh, you know, my body would have to be kept by angels to stand erect. Because, you know, the body without the spirit is what? Dead. Yes, sir. So when I've been out of my body, Lord sent angels to keep me alive, my body alive, so nothing happened to my brain, nothing happened to my heart, my lungs. I don't know if you understand or not. I'm just telling you what I know. I've been there. I've been out of my body and looked back and saw my body in a position. An angel, one angel had this hand up, one angel had the other hand up. And I was so taken back by the first vision, or the second vision maybe, in 83, I didn't even think about asking God what that meant until several weeks later when I calmed down. <laughs> Did you have the people that night you were going to preach about your vision? Heavens, no. What's the matter with you people? I'm just experiencing something, you know, second time in my life. I was a little boy when I had the first vision. I'm going to tell that in just a minute. But no, I don't overwhelm people. I got to figure out what I just saw and why the angel said what he said to me. And they've been there before when I came out of my body at my church one time and went that direction. Nobody knew it but me, me and the angel. Just talking to you. So when you get out of your body, you're still Michael, if that's who you are. Or you're James. Or you're Christina. You can see, you can hear, you can talk. You see what I'm saying? I mean, it, between Hollywood, they make it sound eerie. But you know, you're, you just wouldn't believe how much liberty's in that when you don't have this body on you. <laughs> look something to look forward to. Don't get depressed. Amen. All right. So he said, I, I cannot tell. He said whether I was in the body out because it seemed like I was still Michael. Whatever I was doing or hearing or responding, it was just me. Even though I was out of my body, I still had hands. I had eyes, ears, mouth. Are you listening? Yes. All right. Now, you gotta, I mean, God's got to do that to you for a reason. He did that to, to me for a reason. I'll talk to you more about it in a minute. But I wanted you to see this. He said, or whether out of the body, I cannot tell. Of course, I didn't know either. I'd never been out of my body that I knew of. At that, when I first read this, maybe 50 years ago, Paul said, I was caught up to the third heaven. Maybe I'll talk about that later. But anyway, and then he goes on and repeats that comment. I couldn't tell whether it's in my body, out of my body. So I'm just talking to you about that for a minute. Now, let's go back to Acts 2, and let me ask the people in the sound booth if they can help me here. Do you have the Amplified Classic back there? Okay, would you put up Acts 2.17 and that on the screen behind me and where I can read it there? Acts 2.17, I'm going to read this scripture to you here. That's it. Let's see, okay, and I'm going to read it to you. It's behind me right too, Okay. And it shall come to pass in the last days, God declares, that I'll pour out of my spirit upon all mankind. And your sons, this is written more to a preacher, I think, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, telling forth divine counsels, and your young men shall see visions. It's exciting, I'm still a young man, and I'm 73. <laughs> if you were me, you'd be excited about it. <laughs> and this is what it says, divinely granted appearances. You know, my little, my got a granddaughter, she's mm, nine years old. When she was six, she went to a preschool at a Lutheran church, a Lutheran, Lutheran church. Yeah, they had a school there, and she went there. And so she went in there on show, uh, what you, what's that called? Show. show and tell. And she told, and her mother, I guess, had been talking to her. You know, my son and her are not together now, but I see my granddaughter regularly. And she called me on the phone, and my wife said, she wants to talk to Papa. Okay, hey, honey, what's up? I want you to tell me how I can see an angel. Mommy said that you see angels sometimes. Well, I do sometimes, not all the time. 
And she said, I want you to tell me how to do that. I said, honey, I don't have authority to tell you how to do that. You're going to have to talk to Jesus about that. I don't lie to my grandchildren just like I don't lie to you. I don't know what's wrong with people having, you know, Christmas. And you can have a party and celebrate with a Christmas tree. But my God, you teach your kids that Santa Claus is going to land on the roof? I don't know. And then you go to Easter and you've got the Easter bunny and all kinds of, a lot of chocolate to rot your teeth. I don't know what's up with people. And then you wonder why they're 18. You tell them don't have sex. Or don't do this. Or don't, well, uh, you, what about the Christmas thing? What about the... <laughs> you've already trained your kid to not believe you. Yeah. If you won't tell them the truth. So I, I said, I, can't, I don't have authority to do that. That's why I'm bringing this verse out. It's divinely... That's on his side, not mine. Divinely granted appearances. I can't fast for 30 days and make something happen. I'm not pushing God. Do you know, you're not going to impress God very much. I don't care how good you are. Yeah. You should be good because you got God in you and learn to be better at being, you know, holy and set apart. I'm just talking to all of us. Amen. Me too. But, you know, even if I'm at my best, that's, what, what, why shouldn't that be right and just normal for me to be at my best and you too? He's been merciful to me. I know that because I haven't always been right about everything. You know that. You know what I'm saying. And I've had to repent. But praise God, he's always been there for me. Amen. Even when I first got saved and I was just coming out of drug addiction. And man, I had a lot of stuff wrong. How I perceived people and what I thought about a lot of things. And it was just messed up with drugs and alcohol and my behavior. Like I said, I was hooked on everything but phonics. I'm not even going to tell you some of the stuff I was hooked on. And it was not proper, not appropriate. And I had to work through that. How many know what I'm saying? I had to turn some things down to go with him. And all my drug addict buddies said, yeah, we heard you go, got religion. I said, we didn't get, and of course, I was just as bold then as I am now, just with the devil. I was just getting, a, getting to know Jesus. And I said, I didn't get religion. I got Jesus. See, he's what we were looking for all that time. We were shooting dope and running around with girls and everything else we did that was wrong back then. You know what I mean? No, I don't know. I said, well, you need to try him. You find Jesus, you'll be like me. You'll be different. I don't just go to church. I do go to church out of reverence for him to try to learn about him because the pastor knows more than I know and I'm learning. Yeah. Even that limitation as a certain denominational person. But I respected him. Thank you so much. <laughs> so it's divinely granted appearance. And I told my little, her name is Natalie. And she went on. But mommy said, you wrote a book about it. I said, I did, honey. Well, why didn't you give me one? Well, I didn't know you wanted one. <laughs> then I, I said, do you even read? No, but mommy said she read it to me. <laughs> I said, well, you tell mommy I'm going to get you a book. But I can't tell you how to see into the spirit world, honey. That's not mine to give you. I don't have authority to say you're going to do that unless the Lord would speak to me. And then finally I just broke it down. She was, and I was so thrilled with her because she's kind of a talker. You got some kids that like to talk? Oh, my gosh. And you get them started, it just goes forever. And so, but this time she was like a real adult. On the phone, when, I, when she would ask me something, she'd get very quiet, and I would talk to her just like I talked to Pastor Dennis or somebody else, and she was listening. And I said, okay, let's, I didn't say cut to the chase, but that's what I meant. Tell me why you're all of a sudden interested in angels. Tell me why, honey. Well, because I want to pray for my friends at church, Avery and Bella. Avery's related to Pastor Dennis and Angie, and then the other little girl is with another family. And I said, well, honey, could you follow me in a prayer right now? Well, yeah. I said, okay, say Father. Say, she Father. And I said, in the name of Jesus. And she said, now, I release my faith for Bella and Avery's angels to keep her safe today. Amen. Can you do that every day? Yeah. I said, well, just do that. Do you know more about God? That's sufficient. Yeah. Right. <laughs> As you look, read your Bible and learn more, and you read my, Mommy reads you the book. <laughs> yeah. Then you could pray maybe beyond that, but that's a, just start, a good starting place. Yeah. Okay, now let's go to Acts 26. I don't need to amplify for this, but let me go to this. This is, oh my goodness. <laughs> I looked at the clock. I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> Acts 26 and verse 19. This is Paul. He's talking about some of his visions to King Agrippa, who's a heathen. And I, I don't know if he's the one that said he almost persuaded him. But anyway, he says in verse 19, says, whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. 
So sometimes when God gives you a vision, there is, a, how would I put it, certain things that go with that that you're required to respond to people and begin to teach them and talk to them about. And I'm going to do that right now, but I, was, I wanted you to just get a hold of this a minute with me. Are you listening? Okay. You can write down, I don't have time to go there, but Genesis 15, verse 1, where God says, He appeared to Abraham in a vision to minister to him. And that's what God has done for me in cases. I didn't expect him to appear. I just was praying, living my life. So I, I don't know if you know about me or not. I'm 73, but when I was three, three, about three years old, maybe three and a half, my mother mo noticed me walking and my knees hit on the inside. These bones right here, they were clicking against each other. And she said, oh, my God, I never realized my son's crippled. So she took me to... Barney's Children's Hospital, Dr. Barney was my doctor, and, she, and my, the doctor said, Joyce, that's my mother's name, he's got the worst case of rickets I've ever seen. What'd you do to him? He said, I didn't do anything to him. Well, he's had a deficiency in vitamin, whatever that is, A or D or something, I don't know what it is. But anyway, he said, I'm putting braces on him immediately. He got his staff in there and measured my legs, and they had bolts at the knee. I, I strapped them on at my thigh, and then the shoes were fit into the thing. I still have them at home. I was going to bring them and show them to you, but I figured you'd believe me. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me you'd believe me. Yes, <laughs> okay. And, and I started wearing them when I was three and a half, and the doctor said, don't ever let him take them off except when he's taking a bath. That's it. He sleeps in them. He lives in them. So I wore them for two years there, maybe two and a half. My father left when I was born, so my mom was single. I lived with my mother, my grandmother, my mother's mother. And uh, so then my, my mother fell in love with this other guy named Jack Jacobs that was in the Korean War. And they got married, and I was five years old, and we moved to Springfield, Ohio. We lived in Fairborn. That's about 15 miles. And I had my own bedroom, of course. My mom and dad had a bedroom. And I don't think my next, my next brother was born. I don't remember when I was five or six, but I don't remember him in this situation that I'm telling you about. So I woke up one night, like wide awake, and I didn't feel like anybody was... Uh, touching me or speaking to me. Do you understand what I mean? I'm just sound asleep and I just woke up. But in my bedroom, I had this giant, well, they were at least as big as those uh, things you got there, maybe a little taller, and, you know, huge windows, and it was faced the driveway. And I saw this angel, I don't have my angel book here with me, the small one, that's still got a picture. But it was like that angel on that angel book. He was about 10 feet from me. And he just looked at me. Now, I'm talking about in my driveway. So I'm on this side of the window, and there's a shrub there, and then the, then the driveway starts, and he's in the middle of the driveway, and he's got this thing by him, this some kind of rod thing that goes up above his head about two feet, and he's got his hand on it. He just looks at me. And, you know, I'm five years old. I'm trying to help you here. I'm five years old. I don't know what to say. I, I'm going to tell you about it. I'm thinking in my mind, I was going to say, are you Jesus, or who are you? Are you some kind of angelic being? <laughs> I didn't know. My, I mean, my mother, my mother, she was going to, this was going to change her life forever, what happened. So I said, oh my gosh, I don't know. How. And I couldn't talk. I couldn't talk out loud. I'm, things I'm thinking, I'm wanting to say to this creature, this being, and he's kind of translucent. I could partially see through him, but he was a real being standing there, and there's an aura around him. And so I ran in and got my mother. She's on this side of the bed, and I grabbed this arm, jerked her. And she got out and followed me, and I took her by the hand, and we went right back to that window, and there we stood, and she couldn't talk. I couldn't talk, she couldn't talk, and he didn't talk. Didn't say a word. No, I mean, it's kind of an odd situation. In the middle of the night, it's pitch dark, you know, but he's standing in the driveway lighting it up, kind of. Now, you ask me, if people went by, I don't know, it could have been shielded from other people because the angel was dealing with me. And now, I didn't hear this, I didn't hear any sound, but this is how I felt. There was something coming off of him. And now that I'm older and I realize more, uh, even angels have different degrees of anointing. Remember in the book of Acts, there was an angel came in the cell with Peter, lit up the cell. But there's an angel in the book of Revelation that lights up the planet Earth. That's a big difference, brothers. Yes, sir. But there was something coming off of him. And it went like this. There was no sound to it, but this is the way it felt to me. <laughs> And it shook my insides. I don't remember my body trembling, but my insides were shaking. I had a hold of my mother's hand. I don't think she could even feel it, but I was feeling something. And it just kept going like that. 
You know what I mean? Something was coming from him going into me. I had no idea what it was. I'm a five-year-old kid. And so what did you do? Well, my mom and I looked at each other a couple more times. We looked at him. He's not talking. She can't talk. I can't talk. So we just went back to bed. But my mother took me to Dr. Barney within a month. He took the braces off in his office and said, you got a miracle, Joyce. I don't know how you did it. So I don't know if whatever came off of him did that for me or if he was in there praying for me before I woke up, but I didn't even see him. When I first woke up, I had to go to the window. The curtains were pulled, so, I mean, it wasn't hard to see him once I woke up and looked out there in the driveway, and there he stood. Yeah. Then the doctor said, well, you got a miracle. My legs are healed. I played football. I ran track. You know, I got in a lot of fights anyway. <laughs> Shouldn't have done that. That was not wise. But think about that. That's 68, wait a minute, 68 years ago. I was five years old when that took place. And when I talk about it, it's like I'm right back in that window in Springfield, Ohio. <clears throat> so anyway, that was my first major vision, I would say, that came to me. Then, let's move ahead, 19, that was 1954. Sounds like an ancient person, doesn't it? 1971, I was a full-blown drug addict. And I went to California. I'm already over an hour, so just let me go for a minute. I've just got one vision, and if you give me two or three more, I mean at least three, two more or something, I'm going to pray for you all in a minute, or we let the angels help us. So 1971, I was a full-blown drug addict. I lived in uh, Fairborn, which is my hometown, Fairborn, Ohio. It's out of Dayton, about 15 miles. And me and four other people in that, we had 13 people lived in a farmhouse. We were drug addicts. I mean, we were highly equipped with, uh, you know, weapons, shotguns, sawed-off shotguns, pistols, rifles, just about everything. We put a big two-by-ten in our door so nobody could break through it, we thought. And we went to California to get some more drug connections. I know this isn't very edifying, but it'll come out okay for me eventually. And so I, we went out there, and we, 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 we all went together in one vehicle. We didn't take our guns with us. We knew if we got stopped and had weapons that weren't, identifiable we were going to prison or at least getting arrested until we figured it out so we just left off of our other stuff like that and we went out there to meet some drug people but we never did we just spent our money and got high and finally we we, we got some dope and we went across the hall and I was living in a tenement house I don't know if you know it's like a what do you call those things today what do you where'd you live Dennis when you were project it's like a project only magnified ten times it was a big tenement house, about five stories, and it just looked dark in there. I mean, it looked like an old movie that somebody kicks the door in, just shoots. I mean, it was just wild, like the Wild West. Most people lived in there were drug addicts or pimps or prostitutes or whatever. I don't know what everybody was doing. I was just with my little group. We got some dope. We didn't have any needles, so we went across the hall and got that guy's needle. We all used the same needle. That's maybe how I got hepatitis C. I don't know. I'm just talking. And so I was the last one to go in there. Everybody went before me, and I'm the last guy in there. But I've had a dream before I even left Fairborn that somehow I was going to be sitting on a toilet, not using it, just listen. But there was roaches crawling up the wall beside me. And I woke me up, and I was freaked out about that. I don't know. I'm a bad motor scooter already. You know, I'm not living right. I'm not doing right. And I I'm, I'm <laughs> really had a lot of fear because the police guy said, we got people in my department who want to shoot you and Gary. If they can find a reason, they will shoot you and kill you. You understand that? I said, yeah, how come you're telling us that I'm warning you? Okay. Anyway, I had all kinds of stuff happen back then. They pulled me over one day, and guy grabbed me out of the van, threw me up against it, and I was going to go off on him. See, I wasn't right. How many know I'm not, you're not right to do stuff like that? I had no weapon on me, but I was mad that he did it. And all of a sudden, this other policeman came up and grabbed my arm. I think it was this arm. He said, Michael... I said, who are you? He said, I'm, I'm a neighbor who lives down the street from your mom and dad. Come with me and sit in the cruiser. I went back there and I said, uh, what's up with you guys? He said, listen, you better simmer down. My partner will beat you into the pavement. He's no fool with you. I know you're mad about it and you think you're going to. Don't try to do anything weird because he will hurt you. I said, how come you're being nice to me? He said, because I know your mother. My wife is good friends with your mother and I want to try to I want to try to help you tonight because you're going to be in big trouble if you start something with my partner. He's just edgy. And he was going through my van. I said, well, why'd you pull me over? Well, we heard you had weapons and drugs. I, thank God I didn't have any weapon with me or no drugs that night. Yeah. 
but man, I'm just, you know, I wasn't right. Do you understand that? So I'm in this bathroom shooting up, and that particular morning, for some reason, I counted 57 cockroach, cockroach bites on my legs. 57 of them. We were eating, it, they were eating us up. It's a bad place to live. Bad place to be. And all of a sudden, you know, I put my tourniquet on, I heated my dope, put it in a needle, choot, choot, and then all of a sudden there went that roach up the wall, and I thought, ah. And then the shower curtain disappeared, and it was like a movie of my life. You know, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go to hell for lying, so I'm just telling you what I saw. I'm not, I'm not trying to stretch it. But, and then a voice came to me, and I knew it was Jesus. I don't know how I knew that. And he said, Michael, your life's going down the toilet. And then he said, Michael, go home. And I thought, you know, and I, you might think he's talking about heaven, but see, I'd already died July of that year, 1971, in the summer. And it was a long story. I was on drugs for three weeks, three weeks at a time. Hadn't slept any, and I, I couldn't find my heartbeat. I asked somebody to go get Gary. He was my best friend. He came in the room. He tried to find my heartbeat on me, and I could tell he's freaked out. And he ran off. I said, don't run off on me. <laughs> you know, I can't even find my own heartbeat, but I'm talking. Wow. You just go through things that you shouldn't go through, but I did because I was weird. And then he came back and he said, we're going to take my truck and go somewhere. I figured, this is, I figured he's thinking he's going to die and I'm going to have to get rid of his body. I'm not going to have a, the coroner come out to the farm and go in and pick his body up. And then they're going to interrogate all of us. But instead he took me to his parents' house who were good Baptists. I don't remember saying anything. Don't remember they saying anything. He sat there for a couple of hours. Then we went back home. I think he was having a big party that night and I wasn't invited <laughs> because I'm dying. And so... <laughs> I come back home and laid down on the floor. I had a mattress, but laid down on the floor. I looked at a watch. It was 10 till 3, and all of a sudden, I came out of my body. Through my mouth, I got about to the ceiling, and I saw a hand come out like this. At the time, I didn't know what was happening, and my spirit was right there, and he just pushed it back in my mouth and went down inside me like you put on a glove, and then I'm back, to, I'm back inside my physical body. That's weird. So now when he said to me, go home out in California, I knew I wasn't going to go to heaven right then. I wasn't going to leave. And go. But when he said home, I just intuitively knew it was to my mom and dad's. Yeah. And I went back to them and I just begged my mother. She was a disciplinarian in the house. And I said, I need a place to stay, mom. I know I got younger brothers and a sister. I'm not going to, I'm not going to do dope here or nothing. You're right. You're not going to do dope. You're not going to do anything unless I let you. I said, okay, what do you need? And I said, oh, you're going to get a job. You're going to pay some rent money to us. I said, okay, I'll get a job. All I do is I can't go live with my drug brothers anymore. I can't do that. I, I don't know how to say no to stuff. Because, you know, when you first start being an addict or anything you're addicted to, you say no to that, and then you bust that wall, and then you say, okay, I'm not going to do that. And then before you know it, you're bust. I mean, first said, I'm not going to do anything but smoke dope. Then I said, I wasn't going to do anything. I'm not going to take any kind of chemicals. And then I'm taking chemicals. I'm not going to stick a needle in my arm. Then I'm sticking a needle in my arm. And that was my favorite thing to do. I mean, what was wrong with me? I was becoming addicted. And breaking through every barrier I put on myself. And I said to my mother, I didn't tell you about the guys I talked to. I may go back and talk about that a second. But I said, Mom, I need a place to stay where I can just rest. I'm not going to lay in bed all day either on you. I'll get a job. But if I don't have that, I can't go live with another drug addict because I am a drug addict already. And I'm from the place now, and I think my mom already knew that, but I said... I can't say no. I'm just so messed up, I can't say no. And God warned me I'm going to die if I don't quit this in the bathroom. And I went back out there with those guys. They were all high, and I messed their high up. You know what I mean? Yeah. They'd already shot up, you know, 30 minutes before me, 20 minutes, 10 minutes. And they were all out somewhere in their head. And I went in there and said, I'm going home tomorrow. And they said, oh, man, you got some bad dope. I said, I didn't get bad dope. I know what it feels like when you get dope cut with the rat poison and all that. You get sick. And I'm not sick, but I had an experience with God in there. They said, shut the blankety blank up or all four of us are going to get up and beat the tar out of you. I said, well, you can try if you want, but I'm just telling you I met God in that bathroom. I don't know how to tell you that any simpler. I'm going to go home. I, I said, I cannot live like this anymore. This is my story. I hope you don't think it's boring. And I said, listen, I don't know what's wrong with you guys. I mean, I, I'm not mad at you. But we've buried five of our friends in the last year, plus your girlfriend that hung herself, Gary. 
what is wrong with that? We went to six funerals in one year, and they were all people we were close to. Yeah. All we're doing is dying and messed up or out of our minds. And I said, i got to get out of this. I don't know how you you're just act like it's no big deal. It is a big deal. Yeah. And then I started crying. I, think, I don't know if they felt sorry for me. They had a high on, and I bummed them out. I said, I just got to live like this the rest of my life. So I came back home, and within six weeks, uh, I liked this little girl at church. You know, little girl. She's not a little girl. She's a senior in high school. But I'm 21, and I'm one of the trunk drug dealers in the city. I mean, I was. I'm not now. And so I went to church and she said, I want you to go to service with me. Who's preaching? My uh, brother-in-law. I said, really? He'd witnessed to me before. Of course, I made fun of him a little bit. But I went with her because she was cute. And I'm sitting there and he's preaching. I don't know what he said. All I kept hearing was, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. And I said to my mother two days before I went to that meeting, I said, Mom, I feel like I tried everything 20 times, and I'm still not happy. You know, I'm just not happy. I'm just a mess. And so, anyway, I walked the floor. That I walked up when the preacher said, if you want Jesus, come up here. And he said, bow your head. I want to pray with you. I bowed my head just like everybody, like a good little boy should. I'm 21 years old. And he said, ask if you got Jesus. I said, Jesus, do I have you in my heart? He said, no, you just know about me because your mom made you go to church. Because after I got healed of being a cripple, she told God, I'll bring him to church until he's older. I went till I was 15, and I said, I'm, full. I'm done with that stuff. It's about the lamest thing I've ever done. Of course, my mom could have beat me up probably if she wanted because she's a tough girl. But she didn't do that that night. I just said, I'm done with church. It's just the most boring thing I've ever been involved in. And to be honest with you, if it was still like that, I wouldn't be there. Right. <laughs> but you ought to realize that I've come a little priest now since all that happened. And the signs and wonders and miracles and just loving God and serving him is worth it all. All right, I'm just talking. All right, so... I came back home, I received the Lord. There's 14, 15, 16 year olds around me getting saved, and I got saved too. I went back home a different way spiritually. I went back home the same way I came, you know, in my car with her. And then the next weekend, I went to pick her up. Or, of course, her dad and mother, this was funny, I think, kind of. My mom would go to a prayer meeting on Wednesday night and say, You need to pray for my son. His name's yeah. Michael Jacobs, he's a drug <laughs> addict. He carries a gun. He's going to kill somebody or get killed. Please pray for him. And her mom and dad were in all those prayer meetings. They knew who I was when I came back. And the, the dad wasn't too thrilled I was going to try to date his daughter. He said, you better not pull anything funny with me. I'll pull some stuff on you. I said, okay, yes, sir. And, and I, didn't, I didn't try to do anything out of the line. But what I'm saying is the next Saturday I went there, she met me at the door and said, here's your Bible. Get out of my life. Don't call me. Don't talk to me. That's it. I'm done with you. And she probably made a good decision. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say about that. But you know, I'm just uh, you know I'm just one week from being saved. You know, I'm not sanctified fully like all of you are. Well, yeah, we know. Okay, let's let's. <laughs> I'm not even going to look at the clock. Put a sheet over that or something. <laughs> I just got two more if you can handle it. Yes, so 1983 came. Now, I got saved in 71. Stayed in my home church till 76. God dealt with me about the ministry. I thought, you, what? Ministry? I can't even, I'm teaching four seventh grade boys in the basement of First Baptist, and I can't, learn, I can't I'm, you know, I'm nervous about that because I don't know my Bible. But I loved those kids, and I prayed for them, and I'd send them a little card with the scripture every week if they missed, and I'd call, and I'd talk to their parents to see what kind of condition the parents are in, because if they're not endorsing anything, the kids are just, they don't want it normally. And I did my best to do that, and then I, then I got promoted to teaching the older kids, and then Diane and I got committed to do the whole Sunday night youth group, which was 50 kids. And I was just growing in the Lord, you know. I wasn't, wasn't a super anything. I'm not saying that, but <clears throat> I was married then. I was happy. Da 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 da. You listen to me? Yes. I'm going back to the same Baptist church that I told my mother I'd never come back to. Mm -hmm. But I went back because I needed to hear what the preacher was saying because I didn't know anything. I was smart enough to realize that. I knew a lot about drugs and the humans, but I didn't know anything about God. So 
Then God started dealing with me about the ministry. I said, you got the wrong fellow. I don't think I can do that. He said, you can do whatever I ask you to do. You can do whatever I tell you to do. I said, well, okay, I'll pray about it. He said, you're praying about it. You're right, you're going to pray about it. I'm going to deal with you. And finally, I surrendered, you know, so to speak, just gave it up and said, okay, if you can use me. I mean, you're not getting the best deal of the lifetime here with me. But if you really want to use me, I'll submit myself to you. So I went to seminary and da 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 Okay, anyway, it went on 83, 1983. A friend of mine had a church in Louisville, and he wanted me to come teach on angels. So I went, and I'm down in the, when I drove over there that day, it was 45 minutes away from where I live. I said, you know, nothing personal, Pastor, but I just need a place to pray for a minute before I get up to preach. Would that be okay? You got a place I could just go? Go down the steps and go in the radio room. It's soundproof. You can scream, holler, pray, whatever you want to do. And when you get done, come on up and take a seat on the front, and we'll get you up real quick. So I did that. And I'm down there. I'm just thinking I'm praying. I'm just praying as a young preacher, Father, help me to help these people tonight. Help me to say what I need to say. And And I was teaching on angels, but now I'd only been studying it for... uh, since 1978, so that was what, how many years? Five years. This, I, it's just amazing how little I knew back then, but they thought I knew everything. And so I'm down there, I'm in, on my knees in front of this chair, and I'm praying like this, and all of a sudden, I didn't have those coming. I came out of my mouth. I don't know if you understand that, but my spirit kind of floated out of my mouth, and I started going this way. And I looked back, and there I was. I was looking at my own body, and my hands were up. Angel had this arm up. Angel, that's what I told you earlier, remember? I didn't think to try to ask God in the middle of floating somewhere. I don't even know where I'm going. I don't know how you would deal with that. I just was not accustomed to that. And then I ended up in a big room like this room. And I came back in the floor, and there all this room was filled with angels. I'd say I didn't count them, but there was about 1,000 angels in that room, different sizes, Different levels of anointing on them is what I would say. And the one spoke to me when I'm pretending I'm him. And I was now, he was the first in line. All the angels were behind him. He said, Michael, he knew my name. He always, they always call me Michael. They don't call me doctor. <laughs> you know, Jesus doesn't call me doctor either, just so you know. <laughs> he said, Michael, and he went like this. We're excited you're teaching about us. For we've desired to be involved in the body of Christ. And they won't let us. I couldn't believe that coming out of that angel. They won't let us. And all of a sudden, I began to drift back, float back into the air is all I can say. And I came back into my mouth. And when I got down inside my body, I filled it up. That's all I can tell you. It's like putting on a boot or putting on a glove. And then I'm back in my own, my, my flesh. I'm still kneeling at that chair. And that's when I went upstairs and preached. But I didn't tell them any of that because I wasn't even sure what all that meant. I just know that those last four words haunted me. It affected me in a negative way because I thought, here's these wonderful creatures. I'm looking at them. Only one's talking, this one here. And they don't interrupt each other when they talk to me either. I'm just letting you know something about the angels. They're very polite. (laughs) And he's the only one that spoke to me. He's the only one that needed to speak to me. He said, we're all excited about you, like all the rest of them in that room. But we're trying to help the body of Christ, and they won't let us. Now think about that. They won't let us. And I, I, didn't, I didn't share publicly on that version for four months. And I thought, and I thought, and I thought, and I, I, one day I realized by myself, I must have authority I don't know anything about, and so does the body of Christ. They don't know it either. Because the angel said, God's not letting us, the devil's not letting the body of Christ won't let us. And I don't know how you would have took that. I'm telling you how I feel about it right now. I had a mandate from God to teach people about angels and how to get them to cooperate with the angelic beings. Because the Weymouth translation of Hebrews 1.14 says they're benefits. I don't know why people want to do without benefits that's been given by God. You didn't earn it. You're not that good enough. I'm not either. But it's already in the package of redemption. Just like healing's in that package. Deliverance is in that package. How to have a good marriage is in that package. How to raise your kids for God is in that. Everything we need, finances is in that. Hallelujah. So now you know why I preach like I do sometimes, about, a little bit zealous about it and everything. And I just remembered what they said that day. Now I'm going to move forward to 87. This is the last one I'm going to share on tonight. Is that okay? Okay, it's not going to take me long. But I got into, I started the church at my son pastors now in 1985. 
And you know, when you start a church, it's just a different deal than taking one over. And you know, it seems like to me, the devil sends all the weirdos in the city to you. <laughs> I've been in this a long time. I'm not making fun of people. But all the weirdos came from all the other ch weird churches and tried to take over things in my church. And I had to pray and believe God and help people to get a hold of God and not try to sabotage my work. God told me to start a church, and he said, you can do it, but you're not even my first pick. I said, well, thanks a lot. <laughs> That's what I told him, thanks a lot. He said, but you're, you're tough enough to deal, deal with it. I said, well, okay, praise God. I put my gun on, let's go. <laughs> no, <laughs> sounds like a Texan thing to say. <laughs> I'm just teasing you a little bit. Don't get upset. Hmm. So... 1987 came two years after I started that church. I was in my office. I was so depressed, and I was discouraged. I know you maybe think preachers never get discouraged. When you get in a level like Dennis is at or something, maybe he doesn't. And me too. I don't either get discouraged now. But that was way back then, and I was new to a lot of things. I'd been pastor in a few years and so forth and so on, but I just, and I'm just so discouraged about everything. I'm in my office. I'm sitting down. In came two angels. And just like I tell you before, they always call me Michael, and only one of them talks at a time. They don't interrupt each other. And the other one never said a word to me. One says, we've been, this is the thing I'm saying. Sometimes I've asked God for angelic help, but back then I wasn't saying anything that was right. And the angel that talked to me said, God, we've come from the presence of God to tell you we're here to turn this situation around in your life. Now, you'd think I'd have been thrilled about it, but I was so depressed. I said, I'm not interested. Just go on. If you really say that, yeah, I apologize to you. I have to tell you that. I know you're smarter than me. You would have just filled your guts and got it all worked out. And so they left. And I got my briefcase and put it in my car and started home. And I'm going down the freeway now. And they appeared in my car to me. They didn't open the door either. They just appeared. The one right here was the one doing the talking. The one that was quiet was in the back seat. And something that angel said that last time he talked to me, he said, you know, Michael, God told us to hold you accountable because you know about us more than the average person. You're going to have to say you agree with what God sent us to do before we can do it. If it's not, then we're just going to leave you, and you're going to be in your mess. And somehow when he said that, I, it touched me. I just realized I was being, uh, you know, not nice about everything right then. Do you understand what I'm saying? I got rebuked by an angel. And he made me want to cry. And I said, okay, I agree with everything God sent you to do. I release you now. And it just vanished. And within 24 hours, they had turned that. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do, and the Lord always tells me, he said, when you tell that story, you make yourself look like a B-U-T-T, -T, Michael. You know that, don't you? And I said, yeah, I don't cut myself any slack. Because that's the way I felt at the moment. He said, yeah, you tell the story accurately, but somehow you don't give people a chance to respond if they have something that needs to get done for them. And they got angels assigned to them that will turn things for them. So this, I want you to just listen to me for two minutes, and I'm going to have you come to the altar if you want to get involved in this prayer. The angels that are assigned to you, at least one of them will help turn things that you need turned. I'm talking about one thing. I'm not talking about giving me a list. You don't need to give me anything. I'm just going to ask you to come to the altar in just a minute, and I will lead you in a prayer, and we'll release the angels that are assigned to you that one thing in your life you'd like to see changed. It may be about your mind. could be about finances. could be about something you're doing you shouldn't do. I don't know. If you would like me to pray for you, I'd like you to come up. I'm not going to 
way. Hallelujah. Is that all right? and in our now I want, one other thing I want to do for you if you if you want me to pray if you need Right now. 